Today's project in the shop, what we're doing is a T740 and you can see that we're putting an engine in there. So what we'll do is I'm just, I just wanna talk a few minutes about why uh, we pulled this engine out that was kind of running and why we're putting a brand new Doosan D34 engine in there. This engine did come straight from Bobcat. It's hard to find anyone that will actually rebuild a D34. The precision in these machines is just too, the tolerances are so tight that nobody really wants to mess with these. So even in a repair shop situation, I know it's very expensive. $26,000 is what this engine is costing um, the customer, but you know, trying to rebuild this engine and the time and the labor and like I said, anything that's missed, we put in there and something's wrong, we have to pick it back out, we'll just end up losing money from, so from a shop's point of view, sometimes it's just easier to put in a new engine uh, with warranty and everything. And these engines are available, like I said, from Bobcat, whether you get it from your dealer or they are actually available from shop.bobcat.com, which is pretty cool. Free shipping from them guys when they're available. And it seems like I've had pretty good luck getting engines um, uh, from Bobcat. It seems like their availability is getting better and better. See, we've got this engine hanging above us and what th this machine came to us all the way from Montana. Um, you know, the customer said he was operating the machine and then everything was going good and then it just kind of started sputtering on them and just kind of died never really ran right since um, thinking that it was a fuel injection issue because a lot of times when a diesel engine doesn't run or you have problems what where's the first place we go i mean most people you just want to go straight to the fuel system uh, especially when it was running good you know um, so that's what they did it looks like they put in all new injectors and just all kinds of work fuel filter and you know, chasing fuel lines and all, and never could quite get it running right. So yeah, so the, I mean, like I said, new injectors and everything, they took it to Bobcat. Bobcat was, um, you know, programmed the injectors and they were trying to get it figured out and they couldn't quite figure it out and they just wanted to keep throwing more and more money into it. So they called us and said, yeah, absolutely, you know, if you want to ship it down here, we'll take a look at it. So they did, they brought it all the way down here. And um, on the on the trailer, we started kind of troubleshooting right away as soon as it got here. And I had a bad feeling about it. Just what I was seeing with the injectors, everything was checking out normal to me. I didn't see anything wrong with the fuel system, but it would start and run. Like we got it off the trailer and drove it all the way in here to the shop. Now it was difficult. It kept dying and starting and dying, but you know, it, it took I don't know, 20, 30 minutes or so just to get it off the trailer and into the shop. But it did not sound like a fuel system to me. Um, it, it, definitely sounded like an internal issue on the engine and that's what we told the guy I'm like man I'm sorry but this is not a fuel issue this is going to be a quick turnaround they're looking at probably an engine so um, how did we know well based on experience I've, I've done the previous before I've chased fuel systems and all that but there's a certain noise that these engines make that it, I guess it's just it's experience because I've, I've experienced it. I've went down the wrong road, you know, trying to fix these. But now I know what to listen for and what to hear. And I was like, yeah, we, we, we spun a bearing. So we, we pulled the oil filter off or we started to drain the wheel first. and We could see the shimmer in the oil. And so then we cut open the oil filter and just found chunks and chunks of metal inside the oil filter. And so what we're doing now is actually swapping the engine out. But I just want to take a look at what we found inside, what happened to this engine. Why it happened, I don't know. It's usually an oil starvation issue. Um, the ones that I go out to in the field when they have this problem, like the last one I did was like for, um, <laughs> coincidentally, this is a Sunbelt machine, but this is not owned by Sunbelt, but I went out to a machine for Sunbelt that their mechanics couldn't figure out. Same thing, put a $10,000 fuel system in it. And when I get out there, this thing is like almost straight up and down on a um, ravine into a retention pond. And um, all we could, or all I could come up with is it was just starved for oil and spun a bearing in it. So what happened to this one? I don't know. I mean, it's just kind of hard to, to say for sure, but let's take a look at what we did find. So here's what's inside of our oil pan. We can see, I mean, this is actually chunks of metal and it's just like, gosh, I don't know, that's a 16th inch deep. Look at that. That's all metal particles, metal shavings, you know, and there's literally chunks of metal down here in the bottom of it so this whole oil pan is full of this shimmering metal 
And that's another reason why we don't want to try to rebuild this because there's metal all, you know, through this engine now. And where did that metal come from? Let me look up in here and this is the number two connecting rod. You can see it's just, I get the light right. I mean, it's just black. If we kind of look up there, number one, see it's just nice and silver. There's nothing wrong with that. Here's number three, and of course, number four up there. But number two, just being black, you know, we got it there really, really hot. And then, yeah, oh, kind of gets stuck right there. Yeah, but it's funny, you, you could hear that knock right there, it kind of gets stuck right there. But when the engine was running, we could not hear that knock. There, there, there was no knocking sound, but with all that play, you would think that you would hear some type of knocking, but nope, we didn't. So let's pull that cap off and see what kind of damage happened to the crank. Get this cap off. And... Yeah, see those, no, no bearing whatsoever. That's just, um, straight metal on the connecting rod and of course same thing on the crank too so yeah pretty deep grooves there so yeah it just got really hot the um, you know the bearing just completely disintegrated there's nothing left of it so yep well, that's what happened to this one number two spun a bearing so um, yeah, we just got to get this one kind of put back together, get ready to send back for a core charge, get all our parts swapped over on the other one and get her put back in. All right, so now that we got the engine already installed in the machine, we got the machine out of here, run perfect, you know, no issues as far as that goes. But before I return this core engine, I think this will be a good time to go ahead and let's just talk about all the sensors and everything on this D34 engine. It'll be very similar to the D24 engine as well. So if you ever have any codes or whatever, you need to know where a sensor is, we'll just go ahead and identify everything on this engine. Maybe it'll help you in the future. All right, so looking at the back side of the engine here, it kind of looks like a lot's going on, but it's pretty simple. We do have our uh, EGR, EGR motor right here. That's what this plug is for. This section right here is gonna be our EGR cooler. Now down right here, we can see our cam sensor. And uh, this cam sensor is a 12 volt sensor. So that's kind of unique um, for the cam sensor. Um, up here we've got our EGT, exhaust gas temperature sensor. Um, this isn't used anymore. Um, you can still get the engines, of course, with this on it, but on our newer engines, I don't think we're, we're monitoring EGTs anymore. We don't need to. Of course, our water pump is over here and down here. We can see on the front of the engine, this is our uh, crank position sensor right here. So crank right here and cam position over here. Now on the D24, the cam position sensor is gonna be decked down here behind the EGR motor. It's pretty difficult to get to as opposed to the D34. So it's something just to kind of keep in mind. Um, not much else. Uh, our cooling temperature sensor here is on the back of the thermostat housing. So that one is kind of hard. I've, I have changed these before and you can come in over the top of the motor and get to this sensor. It's not, not a big deal. Of course, our turbo oil return line, you know, comes down just like any return line on a turbo does. But that's all the sensors on the back side of that engine. Not a whole lot to see on this side of the engine. We notice that this pin here and this roll pin is for our tensioner. And the new engine did not come with that, so we had to install a new pin and a new roll pin. I didn't even try to extract these because usually we dam them, jump or scar them up when we try to extract them. So it's always good to go ahead and replace those. And that, this is only on the D34 engine. The D24, we don't, uh, we're not going to have to do that. Come around to the front of our engine. You can see down here is our IMV. Um, I think we all pretty familiar with the IMV by now on the high pressure fuel pump. And the IMV, this is always a brown plug back here. And then down here, we got a green plug, which is also on the high pressure pump. The green plug is your fuel 
pressure our uh, fuel temperature sensor. Um, if we kind of come up in this area here, see if we can get a better shot. What I'm looking at back in here, this round uh, sensor right here, it, it's called an accelerometer. And there's one on each side of the block. There's one there, and then there's one right here, too. I know it's kind of hard to see, but that's the accelerometers. Those are like knock sensors. So if you ever get an accelerometer error, um, those are very sensitive to torque. And so sometimes just loosening it and retorquing the accelerometer to spec will help with that code. I've never had one go bad in my experience. It doesn't mean they won't go bad, but I've never had one bad. I usually find something with the wiring or just retorquing the accelerometer. The accelerometer, like I said, it's like a knock sensor. It detects combustion. That's what kind of feeds our minimum drive pulse in the, um, the ECU, kind of tells us when we're uh, when it's detecting combustion on each cylinder and just helps get that uh, injector timing set right so i'm missing anything in here we can see this right here um there, there we used to have an intake temperature sensor on the intake manifold so you can still see this slug right here it's just not drilled out and machined so we don't have an intake temperature sensor right there anymore so what we did up here on the map sensor, this used to be a three wire, just a map sensor. Now it's a like four wire, so we call it a T-map. So now we're doing our intake temperature sensor and the map sensor all in one right here. So the older ones will have a three wire, and like I said, this one's a four wire for the T-map. Down here on the side of the block, here's our oil pressure and temperature sensor here. So we, we detect both pressure and temperature, kind of the same thing as we just talked about on the T-map. Um, that's where that sensor is. We've just got one ECU connector here, and then we've got this right here. This is what we call the crossover harness, and uh, this crossover is what's bringing that 12 volts into our 12 volt sensors. So, like I said, the IMV is a 12 volt, and the CAM position sensor is also a 12 volt. So that comes through this crossover harness, which is fed by fuse number 21 in the fuse box. So these this little harness seems like it always gets rubbed through for some reason and that causes issues that'll cause imv codes and uh, you'll lose connection with the cam sensor so if you ever get a hard start or a no start well it will be a no start um, you know th this is one thing to check make sure that fuse 21 is not blown make sure that this harness isn't rubbed through and i think that covers all of our sensors does it not well, let me see and really all we got up here is is just our injector harness that comes across the top so what i tell people when when you get injector codes um, very rarely is it actually a bad injector you know if we have a bad injector the ecu doesn't know and it doesn't code us code like if we get a lot of um a leak back through the return lines you know, we've all talked about how injectors go bad, but if you actually get a code for injector, very, very rarely do I find it's actually the injector. It's usually the injector harness, one of the plugs, or most of the time, especially in the D24s. See where this injector harness comes over this bracket right here? It rubs right there, and then on the D24s, it'll actually rub on the, uh, the valve cover right there, and it'll rub through, and you'll get like a one in four injector code or something like that, so that's always a good place to check when you get actual electrical injector faults is to check this harness. I, I can't recall ever having to change an injector where I had an injector code. So just something to keep in mind. Doesn't mean it won't happen, but in my experience, I've never seen it. The only other thing, or the other only thing that we didn't really take a look at was this is the um, engine oil cooler here. Not really a lot to know about that. They're pretty fail safe. Um, the oil pressure regulator is inside. Uh, the bypass and the oil pressure regulator is inside this housing here. If you ever have issues with that, which that's a possibility. The only other thing I want to talk about was we, we, we I did not talk about the fuel rail pressure sensor, which is in the end of the rail here. Um, one thing to check on these D34s, which is different than the D24, is we've actually, at the end of the rail here, we've got our high pressure relief in the rail. Sometimes these do get stuck open and we can't build rail pressure and we'll be chasing all kinds of other issues 
and it turns out that it's actually um, the pressure relief here in the end of the rail is the problem, not the fuel pump or anything else. So that's something to keep in mind. If that gets stuck, all your rail pressure is just going through the return line back to pump. And that's different than the D24 with the high pressure pump. The D24 actually has the high pressure and low pressure relief in the pump. So that's a little bit different than the D34. So something to keep in mind. So hopefully you can find that information useful. If not, or if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks for watching.